Two years ago, I met a guy called Stuart Butler. We met for a coffee over here in this coffee house. And what was interesting is he had asked me to do a piece about Robert Wedderburn. He gave me this book to study. And we went on to create a piece for Last Legs Dance Company about his life, his activism, and what drove him for his, for his political change. I met with a friend of mine who knew about Robert Wedderburn and we discussed his life and his activism and the differences that he has made for us today. But what was really interesting, surprising, that Robert Wedderburn doesn't have a place in British history. Untold stories are a little bit tricky because we don't have the facts behind the information that we're giving. Who are they written by? What are the biases? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to extract information and truths from stories that have been passed on, a lot of them, by word of mouth. So this is what our challenge is with Robert Wedderburn, to get the essence of who he was and the driving force that influences us today in our creative process. Um, I think when it comes to untold stories, there are so many different challenges because A, there are so many different stories. You get them from different sources. Um, and just as you said, the bias that comes with those stories, you have to then untangle. And also because it's a story that has attracted you, you also have a particular inclination to uh, a certain perspective or a view because there was something about either the character or the events in the story unfolding that attracted you. And so you also have to put those things to one side and really just sort of lay everything on the table and I guess it's like piecing together a jigsaw but a really um, strange and beautiful jigsaw because it's based on multiple truths and by fitting all of these truths together um, is how you get a finished piece. I'm here off the road in Stroud and this is a monument that was put up celebrating the ending of slavery in 1833. But it wasn't just the British that were fighting against the Slavery Act. The Maroons in Jamaica also had their way of resistance and they managed to piece out a bit of land in Jamaica that the British allowed for them to keep for themselves. And this revolution started from a woman called Queen Nanny. And it was her story that also influenced Robert Wedderburn that you can succeed with a revolution against a more powerful force. Um, and I think, you know, there's so many different stories about her because she was almost superhuman or she was attributed with these superhuman powers. So there's one story, for example, where she could stop bullets with her buttocks and I thought that was so fascinating because she was a woman she was a real woman who did these incredible things and they were so incredible that people maybe couldn't quite believe that it was a human woman who was able to do these things and so maybe she had help from the ancestors or maybe she had help from God or maybe she had help from somewhere but um, I was just fascinated with that particular story and I think also just the way people um, feed into what actually happened when she arrived in Jamaica because some people believe that she was never enslaved, that she had always existed in Jamaica and that she was part of the land and born of the land and grew in the land if she was born at all. So I guess there's all these questions and these mysteries that surround Queen Nanny which are just utterly fascinating. So there's still many questions about Queen Nanny and her stories um, change and develop as, as time goes on. But stories also were being challenged in the 1800s, in the early 1800s, where people were looking at their religious beliefs. And the inequality in the church also led for people to have different belief systems under one God. Robert Wedderburn was inspired by the Methodists and I wanted to understand a little bit what could have enticed him into this doctrine. So Robert Wedderburn would have been influenced about what John Wesley believed in, which is why John Wesley founded the Methodist Church, Methodist being that we're quite methodical. And John Wesley believed in social holiness, that we can, be, we can have the holiness, we can be holy in thou, 
but social holiness is about having that network not just with with god but with other people and wesley really felt that to make a difference would be to look out for your neighbor there was a story once when john wesley when he was older in life when he was preaching he would go out and he would preach just so that the families on the street who were poor were able to have enough food so Wesley felt that nobody was out from the reach of the love of God, that anybody can receive that love. And social holiness plays a big part in Methodism. And it still does influence the, the Labour Party. Uh, one of the Labour MPs once said that we owe more to Methodism than we do to Marxism. So it does play a big part. And that's why what Wesley believed in, of looking after the poor, all can be saved and all can know that they are saved would have been a big part for Robert Wedderburn. At times I found it difficult to understand how Robert Wedderburn had such an influence on society at that time, considering that his story isn't told to us today. But evidence for me is when William Wilberforce went to see him in prison. That shows that such an important person within the anti-slavery movement would go and visit Robert Wedderburn and inspire him to write his book. With me coming from Hull, uh, William Wilberforce was an MP of Hull in East Yorkshire. So William Wilberforce is a legend, really. He has a, a house there, what's turned into a museum, and people can visit. Wilberforce, if you imagine at the time, even some hymn writers wrestled with their dealings with the slave trade. As one famous hymn writer, Newton, who wrote um, Amazing Grace. He wrote that while he was still in the slave trade, but was wrestling with it that saved a wretch like me. And then after that hymn was written, he pulls away from the slave trade. It would have been the same for William Wilberforce. He would have seen it. And imagine that him deal, going up into the Houses of Parliament, standing up and speaking in front of the MPs, saying how we are dealing with slaves isn't moral, it's wrong. And people laughing at him. Although the Methodists had a strong vision for social change, Robert Wedderburn felt that they worked too much within the political system. And I wanted to get a better understanding why he would have changed his beliefs and moved away from Methodism. I don't know the reasons why Robert Wedderburn pulled away from um, Methodism, but what I do know when you look at church history is that there is a pattern of when the churches uh, aren't doing what they should be and that's why people tend to pull away. So if you look at the Reformation, which is well before, but Martin Luther, who was a Catholic monk, would have been saying, who is it who justifies? It's God who justifies, he loves, but yet, at that time, people were giving money to the Pope because they felt it was the Pope who decides who forgives. And Luther felt that's wrong and he pulls away. And you see that throughout church history. John Wesley, who founded Methodism, pulls away, who was an Anglican priest from the Church of England and the Methodist Church is formed. And William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, was also a Methodist minister pulls away and found, finds the Salvation Army. And it could have been that what the principles of what Wesley believed in, that the people who were looking too much at hierarchy, which then allowed them to pull away and to found their own thing. And that is a pattern that you do see actually throughout church history, where all points to the same, uh, same love of God, but maybe over the years, people have forgotten about why uh, the denomination was founded in the first place. Robert Wedderburn left the Methodist Church and became a Unitarian preacher. And I was curious how this change happened. I needed more information to understand about Unitarianism and how he could have got a license as a preacher at that time. Because there was no formal Unitarian training at that time, most ministers will have received training from another tradition and then chosen to decide that they were Unitarian. But it was also true that people who hadn't necessarily had formal training would also declare themselves as a Unitarian minister without any formal acknowledgement from a body of any description. And that may well have been simply enough uh, for Robert to achieve the status of having a license to preach on a Sunday as he saw fit. 
Robert Wedderman was put into prison for blasphemy. And in the early 1800s, you're allowed to deny the Trinity, but it was still a very sensitive issue. So you, you are right to say that in theory, it was perfectly okay to preach against the Trinity at this time, but this followed hundreds of years of angst and indeed death for people who had chosen to do this. Unitarian name actually comes from the unity of God. There is one God, not Jesus uh, as the Son and the Father and the Holy Ghost. And that's where the name came from. Robert would be obviously aware of that tradition. And that tradition is founded on the prospect that each preacher is able to preach the word of the Bible as they see fit and would therefore use that very much in, in his defence. Even though that may be true, the Church of England was still the legal church of the, of the land and would very much work really, really hard from a blasphemy point of view to take to task anybody who was denying the Trinity and denying the divine nature of Jesus if in fact it was likely to cause unsettlement, not from a religious point of view necessarily, but from a societal point of view. Robert Wedderburn would preach the contradictions in the Bible. And in the audience there would be spies that would take this information back to the establishment. And this was in order to prevent the liberation of the poor at that time. Yeah, part of the blasphemy trial was uh, the explanation from Robert about the contradictions within the Bible. And this is something that Unitarians have had centuries of uh, examining and displaying. So you may be aware, for example, of the Jefferson Bible, where which is well known where Jefferson took out the miracles and an awful lot of the God from the Bible, but still left an awful lot of the good. Um, and there are many, many contradictions between the Gospels and the Old and New Testament, which uh, academics these days have examined and acknowledged. And Robert Will have been highlighting that some of those that were the best of his knowledge at the time in order to defend his position to say, I, I follow Jesus, I revere Jesus as, as, a, as, a, as a man and a prophet and a Jewish rabbi who was speaking to a very politicised situation. If you take liberation theology in South America this last 50 or 60 years, very much coming from the position of the poor and the oppressed, has been a whole process of starting at the baseline of where Jesus would actually operate with those who are in need first, not starting with the word of the Bible, but starting with the word of the oppressed. It seems to me that Robert was highly likely to be doing exactly that. It's interesting how the dramatic success stories live in our culture, but the slow progressive ones don't. It's really interesting, isn't it, as to who is remembered and why they're remembered. Over in America, where the Republic became the Republic, and Thomas Jefferson, amongst many other famous names that contributed to that constitution and change, was Unitarian. And there were many Unitarians involved in that process, running the white way through to the declaration of the Humanist Manifesto in the 1930s. So real li liberal religious change. Robert Wedderburn would have been sat in the middle of that and yet what happened was that there was no revolution in, in Britain that changed things to a republic and that many people who were protagonists in that area became forgotten. And we haven't even heard of them at all in the history that, that I was taught and many of us were taught. It, it also possibly relates to um, how a preacher who operated in a trickster type way um, may have success or may have failure, because it's certainly my understanding that Robert was a, uh, a very lively preacher who would have exaggerated, maybe even taken it further than that in order to get across the point in what is called a trickster way. We're all aware that politicians do that. And if you're on the winning side, the label of trickster will disappear. If you're not on the winning side, the label of trickster may well sit with you, even though it's perhaps an unfair explanation of what it is that you were trying to achieve. Having a Unitarian license gave Robert Wedderburn the platform to fight against slavery and also for equal rights.
And this added to the conversations of revolution that were happening around England in coffee houses just like these. If you were to visit London as a time traveller at the end of the 18th century and go into one of the coffee houses, say along the Strand, you'd see a remarkable sight. You'd see well-dressed gentlemen, gentlemen I'm afraid, no women there, discussing the need for change. And when I say change, they might be talking about, but in whispered tones, we don't need this war against the French. Do we really need a monarchy? Do we need a king? Do we need to be ruled by an aristocracy? Shouldn't we have equality? Shouldn't we have democracy? Shouldn't we have votes for all? They would be whispering this and looking around suspiciously because over in the corner, there might be somebody listening and taking notes. Within these coffee houses, where people talked about the need for political change, you would also find government spies. And those spies may have been paid peace rates. The more evidence that they could supply, the more money they would get. So there is this difficult area where we have a limited amount of written evidence. How much of it was fabricated to alarm the government into thinking there was a real genuine danger of revolution? How much was fabricated so the spies would get more money? How much was true? Paranoia, excessive fear amongst the government ruling class, not only did they use spies, but they also used agents provocateurs, people who would foment and stir up the political radicals into fermenting, creating revolutionary disturbances so that then they could be nicked. Today, if people want to protest, they quickly organise through social media. But in the early 1800s, most people couldn't read. So it's interesting to imagine what kind of process they would have to go through to get the message out to the masses. So Wedderburn preached at that time when uh, there was this fascinating interface between an oral and a textual culture. So his uh, firebrand sermons were part of that tradition where people would listen and would remember. Children, of course, were taught nursery rhymes. They would listen and remember. People would sing in the streets. They would listen and remember. So an oral culture is not one to be underestimated in terms of its power and its ability to stimulate the mind. You may be thinking, however, that if all these slogans were chalked up over the streets and pavements of London, what if people couldn't read? Well, I, I put it to you that you only need one person in ten who can read. And when you have a tradition of communal gathering, in inns or in chapel or in church, and you have a culture of listening and remembering, then it may not matter if only 10% of those people can read. The emotional connection with half of his family being enslaved, the injustice of the aristocracy, and the persecution of his religious preaching gave Robert Wedderburn an unrelenting passion for revolution. And I sometimes wonder, what he must have felt like and if he had any idea of the influence this was going to have on future generations. He didn't obtain what he wanted, political control for the working classes, but he was part of that tradition, part of that continuity. He was a follower of Thomas Spence and Fergus O'Connor, the Chartist leader, remembered the crucial influence of Thomas Spence on the development of radical thinking. And Wedderburn too carried on that torch. So I assert that Robert Wedderburn is part of that domestic British political tradition from 1780 to 1850, but he's also of course part of a global, a global context too. That person who in his campaigning for the abolition of slavery would startle William Wilberforce with his eloquence and with his testimony. So Wedderburn, a person who straddles two contexts, 
the insular British, but also the global imperial British context too. Robert Wedderburn lived to see the Anti-Slavery Act passed in Parliament, but democracy took a lot longer to become part of our social structure. And what we've done is we've taken this story and also information and put it together in dance theatre so that the oral tradition that was so influential for Robert Wedderburn at that time can also live on in this digital age today. These influences that built the life story of Robert Wedderburn and what drove him to make his difference had a huge impact on us while we were creating and also educated us in areas that we knew little about before. You know, I had questions about, well, why, you know, again, and that kind of, why am I doing this and who am I in this, in this, in this story, in this, this bigger picture? And I think it was when I came to the, the um, well, a couple of things, that I wanted to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And I sort of brought it down to that really and that I felt that, that this is everybody's story. This is everybody's story. And, um, and then I felt, it, you know, in the, the, it's okay, that it doesn't matter whether I'm black or I'm white or, what, you know, what the colour of my skin is, that what's important is that I'm a human being and that this is a, a race, um, a, a, a human race issue. This is about you know something as a as a, a human being that I felt uh, driven to to kind of chip away in my own little way. When I was asked to improvise for this performance, I felt a bit daunted at first. It's something that an oboist wouldn't normally be asked to do. We normally sit in our orchestras with our printed music and play from that. So. Um, the thought of improvising was okay for me, but on top of a reggae beat was just totally outside anything that I'd done before. And I suppose it's just a little bit like Robert Wedderburn. Um, the society at the time was trying to separate cultures and he was trying to amalgamate it, bringing it all together. So that's what this piece has done, it's brought the different cultures together. The, the classical oboe and the reggae beat is just um, a metaphor for the whole piece really. I just find it so surreal that someone, he was fighting at that time so strongly on his own um, and he was able just to get so many people and yet now I feel like if we weren't making a story about him or documenting his story now, I don't think I would have ever found him and found what he was doing and that wouldn't have necessarily made me think, oh yeah, hang on, what exactly do I know about black history, black British history? Um, that goes beyond Windrush and so many other stories that we don't know about. So, yeah, I'm just so glad that we're doing it and we get to share it with people and they get to know his name and they also get to associate the stuff that he's written, the stuff that he's done, the things that he's said through theatre and through art and music and culture and bringing it all together for something that can be accessed by anyone. So the thing that I found... Uh difficult to understand was how could Robert Wedderburn and other political activists make such a change by just going into coffee houses and what's quite interesting is because we met in this coffee house here the history I have learned from religious political and also the black British heritage that I didn't know as much about was all influenced by having one coffee, well actually I don't drink coffee, so it was probably a herbal tea, in this coffee house over here. <laughs>